Good afternoon, everybody. I apologize for being a little bit late. Wrangling cats and bringing everybody back after lunch in this beautiful day is not easy. I want to be super honest with all of you. I asked Fernanda if I could moderate this panel because I'm really into food, as you can tell. This is a big thing for me. And not only food is exciting, it's also a big challenge, and it's such a broad topic. And we were talking to Katie earlier. Three of the panelists or speakers that we had this morning had talked about food already. Because food is substance, food is nutrition, food is culture, food is enjoyment. It has to do with climate change. It spends energy. It actually is so connected to our social fabric. Um, Nico was telling us about um, the struggles of people buying ground meat. So there's so much to talk about that I think is important for us to ground ourselves and to have this interesting conversation about the whole value chain and, and how we are best poised to actually keep working towards making sure that we are getting food right. And to that effect, I'm pleased to announce our, our first speaker, um, and she's going to give us an overview of all things food related, and she's going to tell us from her perspective what we should be thinking about, and then the rest of the panelists will join us, uh, join her very quickly. So. Katie Stebbins is the executive director of the Tufts University Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute. Beautiful mouthful. Um, the institute, founded in 2020, hosts the largest university industry food system innovation council in the US. Katie, impressively, previously served as the inaugural secretary for tech, innovation, and entrepreneurship for the state of Massachusetts, leading competitiveness strategies in cybersecurity, digital health, robotics, and advanced manufacturing. With you, Katie Stebbins. Thank you. Thank you, all of you, for coming back from lunch. Um, so, quick raise of hands. How many people here eat? God, I hope everybody's raising their hand right now. Food is a denominator, as Ramon just said. It doesn't matter what topic we're talking about. We all eat. We can come to the table together and disagree, but we can all agree on the fact that we eat, right? And so when we think about food, and we think about it as a, as a grounding moment, whether we're eating together, talking about it, or grounding a conversation in it, it's universal, which is one of the reasons why I think it's so interesting. I'm a city planner by training. People always say, oh, you must be a food scientist, you must be a nutritionist, you must be a doctor or something. Not. I'm an urban planner. Why would an urban planner be in the world of food and nutrition innovation? I say to people all the time, city planning, as we saw earlier, is about systems. It's just multiples and multiples of systems put together to create a harmonious environment where people can live and thrive, where the environment can live and thrive, Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but it's a series of systems that come together to create a whole that we all exist in. So when I was thinking about this day, the future of food, I often think about systems that pull all of this together. Because food isn't one thing, food's lots of, lots of things. So I was thinking about a first bucket of the value chain, right? Farmers, processing, logistics, Retail, food service, all the different ways that we acquire food on a daily basis, the way we use our arms and our legs and our money and our voice to go acquire the calories and the nutrition that we need, right? How many of you are from a university? So I think about all the different departments at a university, this is hardly an exhaustive list that would somehow interact with food. At Tufts University, we have 10 schools, and I can tell you that all 10 schools at Tufts University, including the one where I work, the Friedman School of Nutrition, is involved in food, biology, chemistry, economics, law, policy, health, and art. I have two art students working for me right now. One of them is working on uh, food as a ritual in religion. And another one is working on queer food frameworks. Fascinating how we think about food and culture and what we need on a daily basis. By the way, I will pause there to say, the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts, where I work, it is the only graduate school of nutrition research in the United States. 
There are departments of nutrition in public health schools, in the medical schools and other places, but we have the only school of nutrition in the country. That's a blessing and a curse sometimes, right? Uh, when, you're, when you're alone, you're sort of waving the flag. Um, I'll, get to, I'll get to one of the earlier presentations and why that creates uh, uh, challenges. Um, another one, I think about the systems, the community, right? The, f the, the food and community. How do we make sure communities have enough food? I'm looking at the news right now of hurricane devastation. And all I can think about is how do those communities in Florida and Puerto Rico and how do places in other communities around the world have enough food, have enough nutrition, have enough of a lifeline to keep people going. So community can be something we come to around food. It can also be something as a community you're desperately trying to innovate in the moment because you don't have enough of it. NGOs often are involved in how we acquire food, calories, nutrition for communities. NGOs, both international aid agencies, local nonprofits, play an incredibly important role here. Not to mention environmental and uh, food justice groups, all sorts of NGOs. Ventures, businesses. I'm really excited that two of the panelists that I'm gonna be speaking with today are actually industry members on a council that I run that I'm gonna tell you about. Startups, um, big companies, small companies, but obviously the ventures in this space are incredibly important. Schools, our kids go to school and they have to eat meals. This is a lot of how kids learn their dietary preferences, somewhat at home, but somewhat at school, which is a little scary. My kids refuse to eat the food they're given at school because um, it's disgusting, in all honesty. Hospitals, it's kind of interesting if you stay in a hospital and you see what you're served. Sometimes you're kind of scratching your head going, is this high salt, high fat, high sugar meal really what I need to recover right now? Sort of interesting, where did it come from? You know, institutional food and government. Obviously, government's important to this. We were having a conversation earlier about USDA, FDA, federal regulations, food policy. The government controls all sorts of things, how we ship food, how we store it, where we grow it, how we label it. They tell us how we should consume it, how we shouldn't consume it. Sometimes we think they're right, sometimes we think they're wrong, right? And then other systems that come into play. Climate, as I mentioned. Both how is climate change impacting food supply chains, but how is the food supply chain impacting climate, right? That's a two-way street. Soil health, we have depleted soils in this country and in this world that aren't producing the nutritious foods that they used to, and there's a lot of movement to try and bring nutrition back into our soils. Energy, making sure that what we are doing is produced with clean energy, which I think is very interesting, and how does waste, food waste actually go into producing energy? Um, food waste itself, we throw away a lot of food and we have a lot of farm loss. We have a lot of loss from farm to, to table. And equity. Equity is a huge one and I would wrap equity up with something we heard earlier, which is labor. The food system, one out of every 10 people in this country in the United States works in food. One out of every 10. Last week they had a White House conference on nutrition, the first time in 50 years the White House has, has had this kind of an event, Tufts was involved. And one of the people on the panel from the labor union said that 70% of the food workers are part-time workers. This means they don't have the benefits. They're not making full-time wages. And he went on to say that we would be heartbroken to see how many of the people that make, produce, harvest, plant, supply, drive our food are food and nutritionally insecure themselves. What a travesty in this world that the people who grow our food and make our food and provide us our food don't have enough money or resources to feed themselves. There's a systems change that I think we all need to get behind. So, and you can think of many more. This is why food's also overwhelming. You can also all sit there and write down in your notebooks 10 more systems that you would pull in, right? So I also thought about the agenda today and the speakers we had, ESG. We heard about food in the ESG panel, right? We heard about labor and, and uh, people that make food and the injustices there. At Tufts, we've been talking about ESG plus H. So we have environment, we have social, we have governance, but what about health? And what if ESG included a health framework that talked about just that, making sure that the workers have the food and nutrition they need, making sure that a company 
is creating access to the healthy foods that it's producing so that people aren't priced out of a healthy diet. Cities of tomorrow, as a city planner, I loved that. And I think about how would I design a city of tomorrow? How would I design the perfect city? And how would food be a part of that story? And our friends from MIT touched on that. There's so far to go in that. Could a community supply all of its own food? Should it? Again, if you have a climate disaster, you're going to need large companies who have large supply chains to come in. But this is about systems working together. At what point is it appropriate for food to be local? What food should be local? And what food and systems need to be national and multinational? These are all questions that we have that we need to figure out. The life sciences revolution. Our first speaker today talked about therapeutics. Very interesting if you think back to the slides that he was mentioning. And I asked him about this out in the hallway afterwards. I said it had nothing about nutrition really on it. There was nothing. Now, he talked about expression of genes being triggered by food. But if, if bad food can trigger an expression of, of gene abnormalities, shouldn't we be talking about what we should be eating and what we shouldn't be eating? Your genetic code's not a foregone conclusion. And so in that world of therapeutics, because we're so driven in the therapeutics world by, quite honestly, profit margins of the pharmaceutical companies, Food as a therapeutic doesn't really have the profit margins of statins. It just doesn't. There's not a lot of intellectual property in green peppers. And so we find, and this is the issue again of being at the Friedman School, the only school of nutrition in the country, sometimes being on the nutrition islands a little lonely because there isn't the intellectual property and there isn't uh, as much sexy therapeutics that come out of it. But at the same time, food is the leading cause of death, the leading cause of death in this country. And yet, we sort of let it be a sideline player when we talk about therapeutics. Let's figure out what's wrong with you. Let's give you a drug to fix it. I would argue we need to be able to figure out what's wrong with us. We need to be figure out a diet to help us be healthy. And then we need to monitor that situation. And then energy for a clean future. Um, you know, again, I just think there's so many ways that we need to be producing food, especially if you're doing it indoors, other places where it's healthy. So I have the wonderful privilege of, at Tufts University, standing up and running something called the Food and Nutrition Innovation Institute. We formed about two years ago, but the council formed about five years ago, and we have five pillars. So we have the Food and Nutrition Innovation Council, which I'll tell you more about. We have a design lab for food system innovation, where I have students and individuals from all over Tufts University coming together in that systems thinking. Well, this is why I have art students at the table with diplomacy students, at the table with nutrition students talking about how do we fix food. We have events, we do communications, we do white papers, other fun things, and we have fellows, Fulbrights, learners. Hopefully at some point we will have folks from Chile in residence with us. I think that would be wonderful. But let's talk a bit about the Food Nutrition Innovation Council for a second. So what's really exciting to say today is that uh, this, this uh, logo map is about to change. And we're adding two companies from Chile. One's AgroSuper and one is Carozzi. So huge round of applause for two Chilean companies that have just joined the Food Nutrition Innovation Council. That's a pretty freaking impressive, I mean, I'm just not, I'm not tooting my own horn, I'm just saying. That's a pretty freaking impressive uh, spread of companies which Chile is joining. And this is important because every food, every food company pretty much that owns the global, global food supply chain is at the table. And why? Because we have to be at the table together to figure out the solutions. And people will say, well, why would you let a company at the table which doesn't produce 100% healthy food? Because we all need to sit at the table together and build a better mousetrap. And nobody should be out in the cold. No one should be outside of that conversation if you're truly dedicated to creating a solution. And I'm really excited today you'll get to hear from uh, Maury and Motif, which are also both members of my, of my council. So we work on a few things together. The group, being at 91 members now, uh, is pretty large, and I can't have 90 relationships with everybody. And so I said, what do you guys care about? So there's four areas we work on. Food is medicine, precision nutrition, Sustainable nutrition and nutrition security. 
Food as medicine goes into two groups. One is the functional foods, bioactives of foods, and the other one is how does healthcare system start to prescribe produce, medically tailored meals, uh, as a therapeutic, as a medical intervention to modulate disease. So there's those two pieces of that. Precision nutrition, precision nutrition fascinates me, you guys. Because what if we had the diagnostics to really understand, each of us as a machine, what we were missing? What if after lunch today, after you had your wraps, and you had your cookies, and you had your chips, and you had your water, what if we were able to know, what if that food, I mean, you can answer this in your head, no slam on what we had for lunch, just thinking about this, what did we have that's gonna help us build new cells, new healthy cells in our body? And what did we indulge in today that I don't think is really the building blocks of the healthy cells that we wanna be putting in our body, right? So when we eat and we think about those things, that's very interesting. But precision nutrition is about this N of one experiment, right? It's what I have on my watch. It's all the biohacking that I'm doing. It's the samples of my bodily fluids I'm sending in and they're telling me what I'm missing. But at some point, all of this N of one data has got to come back and show statistically that there are reasons why we have to change the food system. We can't just develop new therapeutics to address the outcome of bad food and bad eating. The food system and the food companies, we all need the evidence to see that it is incumbent upon the perpetuation of humans on this planet <laughs> that we do better. And I think through precision nutrition, feeding into food as medicine, we're addressing that. Sustainable nutrition, of course, is how do we do this without doing any harm to the planet? I keep saying, and you guys might agree or disagree, I think it's a unicorn. I think there is a golden unicorn that will walk through someday and say, I am good for the planet, I am good for the body, and I am very accessible to every human being on this planet. I would argue you might be eating two foods on the planet if you, know, if you were gonna construct your diet that way right now. It's a very hard problem to solve, but it's a very important problem to solve. And then nutrition security is about the fact that so many people are food insecure, and we tend to talk about food insecurity, but the acquisition of calories isn't really getting us anywhere, is it? Even if you're low income, we have a lot of obese, low income people in poverty. Why is that? because we're acquiring calories that are crap. They're sugar, they're white flowers, et cetera. So nutrition security is about thinking about how can those calories also be good for you? How can they be nutritionally dense? Because if you're gonna eat, you better be eating well, especially if you don't know where you're getting your next meal from. So those are the topics that we focus on. And then within each of those groups, there's three main areas that we look at. We look at the research. This group comes together and they talk about in this pre-competitive, it's a pre-competitive group, right? Like, what is the research that we all care about that we know that we need to fund, look at? On that technology roadmap, where are the innovation blockers? And how do we make sure that this research in food nutrition is not biased? How do we make sure that it actually has equal representation for all of us who eat and not just a few? Communication. How many of you are on social media? And how many of you are inundated by companies telling you what to eat, when to eat it, how to eat it, your macros, your micros, your exercise? I mean, I go on Instagram and I feel so bad about myself and all the foods that I should eat, I shouldn't eat, it's, it's mind boggling, right? There are some ways and standards by which we should be communicating. And there are some egregious ways in which we are miscommunicating, misinformation that is doing harm and we need to have standards in this system so that uh, we're doing this responsibly and protecting the consumer. And we talk about that. And then the market. How do we launch products into the market in a way that also has standards? What are we launching the market? Right now in the United States, you guys can pretty much come up with any kind of Katie's vitamin juice, and I can put an asterisk on it that says, not approved by the FDA, so eat it at your own risk. But believe me, it's amazing. But Nothing I can say can equate a medical claim, which it won't, but there's crafty ways that we write things on bottles and things so that it kind of does and it kind of doesn't, right? Yes. So we, talk about, so we talk about the market. So those three things are really big focus areas for all those companies I put up there. So it's really fun to get to work with all these companies on these things. Does any of this change overnight? Of course not. But systems change doesn't happen overnight. Systems change happens over 
years. I'm a city planner, I have a lot of patience. We have 20 year timelines. Many of you say we don't have 20 years to wait. You gotta start somewhere. And systems this complex don't change overnight. So food is, there's so many things you can fill in here. Food is culture, food is family, food is nourishment, food is bad, food is good, food is calories, food is nutrition. At the end of the day, as you all showed in your raise of hands, food is essential. This is not a set of systems we can ignore. This is not a problem we can ignore. This is something that no matter what area you work on, you don't have to work directly in food, no matter what you work in, you should be asking yourself, how is this essential part of everyone's life at least once a day, if not three or four or five, six time, times a day, essential? And how can I be a part of making sure that people are getting what they need in a healthy way that protects the environment uh, and protects people? So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. That was awesome. And I really want to grab your last point because it, I think it's a great segue for our, our next speakers. And it's really about like understanding where can you play, where you can add value in the value chain. We tend to think about food startups, people that are in the, in the food manufacturing space, but there's, different, there's really a, a myriad of things that we can be doing to contribute that. And, and, and with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Philippe Procherson who is the Vice President of Bioscience Analytics and the Head of Synthetic Biology at Motive Foodworks, located here in Boston, a company that I'm very familiar with. He has been working at Motif since early 2020. Philippe has more than 10 years of biotech experience in the synthetic biology sp space, ranging from small molecules to protein productions in various microorganism platforms. Prior to the biotech industry, he was an assistant professor at the University of Kansas, studying chromatin biology in brewing yeast. He holds a PhD in cancer biology from the University of Paris, Anse, France. And with that, I'll let you take the stage. Thank you. Welcome, Philippe. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Oh, there you go. All right, so uh, let me take you through uh, what we do at Motif Food Works. We're a fairly young startup, focusing on uh, food technology and alternative proteins. So that's what we do here. We are trying to make and focusing on plant-based food to be better testing and also nutritious. And that goes back to what we just heard today. And we really want to make desirable, so desirable that people really crave them and don't hesitate to come back to the plant-based food instead of going to the animal alternative. And as you know, the evolving consumer's values are moving fast, especially on the health, it's one, one aspect. Sustainability is a big one, and then also animal welfare. But if we focus on sustainability, plant-based can be an answer. So, as you know, the environmental impact of animal versus plant protein is uh, amazing, huge. Uh, the majority of greenhouse gas emission, 78% are coming, at least in the agriculture, comes from animal product. 70% or so of the whole agricultural land are dedicated to feed and raise animals. And this is not really sustainable. We're 8 billion today. In 2050, planning to be 10 billion people. The way we are feeding the world, it won't work. On top of the climate crisis, we're in the middle. Reducing consumption of animal-based food will reduce 40% among the, us, will save the area of twice the size of India and save 168 billions of tons of greenhouse gas emission, three times what was produced in 2009. So this is amazing. And this is the climate crisis. This is why we should all focus on this because our kids will live through 2050 and they have to deal with a lot of consequences if we don't do anything. So how do we try to tackle this? Try to have more people eat more plant-based? Well, we mix three things here, science and technology, culinary arts and design thinking. And each of them are looking at mechanisms, function and enjoyment. And this is ultimately to create emotion. Eating food is a very emotional thing. You remember uh, your grandma's uh, favorite food, you remember a restaurant, you remember all sorts of things. Between, be, be, when, when you eat, your senses are all in alert. And that's very important. And it has to be pleasurable. We eat three times a day at least. So we want to provide food that's good. 
And that's where it's a challenge for plant-based because if you eat just raw plant-based protein, it's really not good. Animals love it, but we don't. So what do we do for that? So we're focusing on ingredients at the base, so alternative proteins and also food technology ingredients. And we create ingredient system and also finish format. But ultimately, we have individual ingredients that are catered for specific functions. Um, and then when we mix them together, we can make actually amazing formulation. So our uh, market here is mostly CBG and food manufacturer. We ultimately want to be an ingredient company that provides solution for plant-based companies. And then we also work on finished product because in the middle of showing and, and developing those ingredients, we have to make examples of our food. Uh, and it turns out we've done a pretty good job at, at that. And our plant-based burger is one of the best out there. I wish you could buy it yet, but it's not available soon. So here I'm going to focus a little bit more on the synthetic biology and the alternative proteins. And here I'm showcasing Emami, which is a bovine myoglobin replica. It's the identical protein that we make uh, in, through precision fermentation. And I will give you a brief overview of the, the precision fermentation. Um, how do we do this? So we're, we're using precision fermentation to produce flavors and, and function. So flavors is one thing. They're small molecules, protein. Myoglobin is one of them. That's what gives the meaty taste to, to meat. And then there's also functional protein that we're looking for. If you think about it, right now, precision fermentation, other companies like us, we're taking animal proteins uh, from milk, from the egg, or from meat, and then we express them in precision fermentation in a microbe. So we're using microorganisms, all sorts of different microbes, bacteria, fungal, yeast, to program them with these genes that our interest to us, and then we, we use those little microbes as mi micro factories. So right now we're focusing on animal replacement. So we're taking the animal protein, the gene, put it in those microbes and make the same protein without the animal. Ultimately, we want to push the boundaries further. Uh, when you think about functionality, gelling, foaming, emulsification, what milk does or what uh, an egg does, you can actually imagine that out there in the world, in this biodiversity that we have access to, there's better protein to do these things. But nobody's ever tested them because uh, they're not, you cannot grow them, for example. So the approach of synthetic biology is to be able to assess the functionality of novel proteins that could be a better egg replacement than an ovabirin, for example. And that's what the future will hold here. Designing these uh, microbes takes a lot of time. So we have our partner is Ginkgo Bioworks. It's located at Seaport. You've heard of them, I'm sure. Uh, they're big in the bioeconomy and all sorts of synthetic biology programs. And they design, build, and test uh, those, those strains to make new generation and to increase the productivity. So this is an example of our bovine myoglobin. And your generation one was an expression of 100. After four generations, four iterations, we reached 300, so multiple by three. And now we are in the game of a commercial product. Uh, economics is very important. Uh, those precision fermentation products are expensive, and you need to maximize the expression. And as a representation, you can see these little bioreactors that we have in the lab. Uh, generation one was a little pale. Generation four is bright red. You look like, when you open the cells, it looks like blood. And you'll see it in, a, in another slide here. So. It takes, it takes a village to, to go from the bench to commercial scale, and it took us a record time of less than two years, actually, to do that. This is the first bottle of Emami that we have here. It was around 30 grams of bovine myoglobin. And as is, this is how it looks. It looks like blood, and it takes, like, blood and meat. And then nowadays, we're at commercial scale. We have metric tons of this amazing product. And on the right here, you can see the, how, it, how it, it, it changes uh, plant-based uh, burgers. The raw patty would control, this is a TVP, textured vegetable proteins, and then you had 1% of emami and it turns red like, oops, I don't have to go back. Okay, here. Um, it turns red like a real uh, meat patty. And then when you cook it, it also behaves the same way as a uh, uh, meat patty. Uh, it turns brown and the taste stays there. I didn't show a a cut of that, but it, it remains red 
radish exactly like you would get in your burgers. So this is our first commercial product here derived from precision fermentation. We also have texturing agent that we mix in these burgers and that will reproduce the, the kind of the connective tissue that you have in meat and give you that springiness when you eat it. Uh, because otherwise just, again, plant proteins on their own, they're going to be pretty mushy. So really what, what we're doing at Motif, we're solving for sensory challenges and also nutritional deficit in plant-based food. So we're focusing on, on meat alternative, the taste and the texture is very important, and different forms. You imagine that uh, the challenges to make a plant-based burger is different than a plant-based sausage, different than uh, a plant-based uh, other sort, anything you can dream, even a whole cut, for example. Uh, some people are working on this. Dairy alternative, it is a big thing. Uh, dairy, milk alternatives are very common. You can find them. However, cheese alternatives are a lot more compli complicated here, especially about the texture and the stretchy. So pizza cheese is a big thing. It's a huge market. Uh, if we could displace some of the pizza cheese to uh, dairy alternative, that would be a huge market uh, and a huge save for the planet. But the texture is not there. So we're also working on... Uh, uh, food technology alternative, as well as alternative proteins to, to make that, derived from milk. Nutrition and performance, very important as well, uh, to make nutrition uh, on par with animal proteins. As you might know, plant proteins are not always balanced. They're not always equivalent to the animal proteins. And they're lacking some amino acid that you need to complement. And we have solutions for that that we're working on. And then you, we're also developing new food forms. Uh, we, we're stuck with what we're, we know with what we've been cooking for um, thousands of years, I would say, um, more in the hundreds of years, the, the development of culinary, uh, all sorts of forms. Well, using plant-based, we can actually design new things that now appeals to a, a, a new sense. And, and that's also what we're working on. If we just stick with burgers, people don't always eat burgers and they don't like burgers, but there's all sorts of things that you can do to put plant proteins into a finished format that will taste good and excites uh, your buds, your taste buds. Thank you very much. Helene, that was awesome. I, I honestly feel that, especially for the Chileans in the crowd, we should thank Philippe. We ha our identity is so tied to La Barrilla, to the barbecues, that the fact that he's making more delicious plant-based food is going to help us because we're definitely moving in that direction, and we have high standards in our country. So really, really appreciate it. So um, for our third panelist, we're super excited to have uh, Leith Abu Taleb from, from Mori. He's the Chief Strategy Officer and General Counsel at Mori. At Mori, he oversees all the technical teams, including from food science, material science, and engineering teams, as well as the legal and regulatory functions, which I believe are important as well. Mati um, he has a background in bioengineering and law, his experience in innovation and intellectual property encompasses works regenerated for companies such as Akinomoto, Philips, AstraZeneca, Simmer, BMW, and others. He also serves as an adjunct professor at the Howard University School of Law. Uh, let me leave you with Leith. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Um, soy Leith Abu Talib. Uh, yo trabajar en Mori. Um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit fast today, just, just for, for time's sake, so let me know if I'm a little bit too fast. Um, over one-third of food is wasted in the world, um, and what we hear, what we do at Mori is try to stop that and try to recapture that waste and add value. The question that we always ask ourselves is, what if food was more resilient? And so we're not only thinking about food waste as food in the trash can, but we're thinking about food waste as in what if our supply chain was a little bit stronger? Can we change that up, right? H how do we en enhance our food? Uh, how do we go into the future with our current food supply and feed more people? Are we able to ship further? Are we able to ship hotter? Are we able to ship into new markets? Uh, really, um, we operate uh, really in four major verticals. We help reduce waste and improve quality. Um, we enable sustainable packaging options. We also help with logistics and flexibility in the supply chain. And of course, we help with predictability and inventory uh, planning. Um, and I'll talk about exactly how we do that. Um, so we directly address why food goes bad. There's three major reasons why food goes bad. That's gas exchange, water loss, and microbial growth. 
through a novel silk protein that we do that is an edible protein. You can't taste it, you can't feel it, you can't see it, um, but you can eat it, safe to eat. Um, we are able to uh, preclude all three of those things. And it really all starts with silk. When I say silk, I mean the same silk that we use as textiles. Silk is an ingredient that has been consumed for centuries and centuries. We like to think we rediscovered it, not invented anything here. Um, and uh, really goes back all the way to the Silk Road, um, where folks in East Asia, towards my countries in the Middle East, um, towards Europe and then beyond, were consuming silk as an ingredient. Um, there are two major proteins in silk. We care about one of them. We only use salt, water, and heat. Nothing else in our process to get to the process, to get the product that we want, which is just a, a water soluble powder. What makes that protein special is that it's universal. Uh, it's a self assembling protein, which means that we can actually coat the outside of your watermelon and the inside. So we can form a coating on something that's wet, not only something that is hydrophobic and something that, that is super dry. Because it's a water soluble protein, it also easily integrates within existing workflows and equipment. So when we talk about silk on leafy greens, for example, we're working on the existing harvester. We're not selling custom deposition equipment. We're not out there with our own pieces of machinery. We're saying, show me your process and I'll add silk to it. Um, of course, it is also safe. Um, we are approved in 15 different countries. We'll see that a bit later. Um, we've done every single test that you can imagine uh, just to ensure that this is safe. As Katie, Ramon, and others will have said, Food is family, food is everything, and, and the way we think about food safety is it should be safer than anything else in the world, right? When we think safety and FDA, we always think drugs, medicine, this, that, but my medicine is locked in the cabinet, my kids can't get to it. But my apple is on the counter, right? And so I need, I need to make sure that every single person that eats this is, is safe, there's no problems whatsoever, whether that person's a child with allergenic issues, whether that person's a senior, whatever that person might be, they better be eating my product and, and be safe. Our platform exists um, and really spreads across different food items. Um, we mentioned leafy, I mentioned leafy greens for a second. Uh, we also work on things like cut vegetables. Those are zucchini noodles in that picture. Uh, cherries, avocados, fish, and candy. Candy is an interesting one. Um, we've all had uh, you know, that piece of cough drop that's been on your pocket for uh, three different laundry cycles, right? And it's still fine. Um, so we're really not talking about extending the shelf life of candy here. We're talking about enabling different uh, biodegradable packaging options, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a quick second, too. Uh, really starting here with, uh, this is a, a quick time lapse of baby kale. Um, this is over the course of a single day um, on a counter next to a window. Um, we consumed the kale that was here on the left. I'm gonna go back and forth one more time just so we can see that. Um, on the left side, that's uh, kale coated with mori silk. On the right side, it is not coated with mori silk. The left side, you can still eat it. The right side, that's in the trash can, right? You go to Whole Foods, you go to Trader Joe's, and that coal bar, that's gone, right? Whereas the mori one, um, that allows that to, to, to extend that shelf life. Not only are we able to extend the shelf life, but really we're able to increase freight. So the same mechanism of our ability to increase shelf life, it's a respiration game, right? So we don't really think about our food as being alive, but it is, especially when it's produce, right? And so these spinach leaves, they breathe, right? And that respiration causes heat in your trucks and in, in freight. Um, because of that, freight trucks aren't full of spinach at any point in time in, in the whole supply chain. No matter how cold your coal chain is, no matter how cold your coal truck is, that gets hot in the middle because of that, that respiration. Putting silk on it at the harvester level reduces that respiration, fill that truck up to 100% and we're good. We're in 142 different market baskets, a number of Trader Joe's and Whole Foods up here in the, in the Northeast on our first commercial trials, and we're in the market already on exactly this. And we've been able to take a significant number of trucks off the road in just commercial trials here. We talked a bit about candy earlier. Um, so as we all know, complex non-recyclable, non-biodegradable packaging is required to maintain that candy's shelf life, right? Again, we consume old candy, but it sticks when it's touching each other, right? And so you need all these pieces of non-biodegradable, non-compostable wax paper that's gotta be in the trash can if you're lucky. Odds are it's on the streets, odds are it's somewhere else, right? And how do we get rid of that? We get rid of that with silk, right? And so here, as an example, we've been able to coat the candy itself to enable different packaging, right? So generally speaking, without silk, without a, without a coating like ours, that will brick. And I can't put that in my cup holder in my car. 
I can't put that in my pocket, right? And, but with Silk, we are able to um, do exactly that and really be able to in, allow new, enable new biodegradable packaging, uh, enable different uh, mass packaging, less uh, uh, you know, single use, et cetera. On the regulatory side, I talked about safety. Um, we're quite transparent. Um, the name Mori comes from Bombix Mori, which is uh, the, the Latin word for silk. We always talk about what our ingredient is. We never hide what that is. Um, we're, con we're able to be consumed in 15 different countries, 40% of the world's GDP. Um, we're grass here in the United States. We're approved as a natural food, as a non-novel food in Canada. We're approved in Japan and South Korea. We're working on Chile, so fingers crossed, everybody. Ramon, you can pull some strings. Yeah. Um, so we're working on Chile, of course, and uh, other countries as well. Um, looking forward to, to really being uh, really around the world. As we all know, food is a very difficult supply chain, right? Everybody eats, right? And so approval in the States doesn't matter if we get our avocados from Mexico. Approval in Chile doesn't matter unless we get approval in China as well, because that's where the tilapia is going, right? And so everything is quite interconnected, meaning that we're, we're really either a global company or not a company at all. We're protected by 31 patents. Um, our technology is born out of the Tufts University Silk Lab. Um, we have our own patents plus an, ex plus an exclusive license to Tufts University's IP. Um, 31 patents, we have 12 applications. We're protected in 21 different countries, and that's for everything from packaging to food to the silk itself. We have about 75 employees right now, close to $100 million raised. We're a majority minority. Um, we're 48% women, 45% men. Um, we have offices in Boston, in DC, the office that I head. We're in Mexico City. We're also in Salinas, California. Um, as mentioned, we're in the tender leaf market um, and excited to talk about our broad regulatory approvals. And that's it for me. Gracias. Thank you very much. Why am I not surprised that so many of you were taking pictures, athletes, slides coming from a country that depends so much on the export of, of fruits and avocado and salmon. So this is so apropos and so excited to have you here and sharing your story. We really can't wait to get those approvals on everything expedited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know some people. I thought the pictures was just me. Yes. <laughs> well, that's, that too. That too. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank um, you for having me. Last but not least, we have our, our friend of the house, a representative from Sofofa, we have Alan Garcia, who's the executive director of Sofofa Hub, a spin-off from Global's main industry association that connects corporate business challenges with global innovators. Sofofa Hub also hosts a biotech center supported by the Chilean government that helps connect biotech solutions with industry opportunities within food, agriculture, pulp and paper, mining and health sectors. Alan previously held as a country director for Technoserve and various positions at Corfo, including COO, a member of the Innova Chile Advisory Board. He previously founded two IT startups serving the retail and telecom sectors. I'll leave you with Alan. Take it away. Thank you. Okay, well, um, I'm, I'm, I'm really privileged to, to join this panel. Um, my vast experience with food has been mainly concentrated in eating, so I won't talk about uh, uh, the, the scientific and technical part uh, that my, my co-panelists uh, know much better. Uh, I'm going to talk about a bit more about Chile and, uh, and what are the challenges we have. So first of all, okay, let me come here. So the food sector in Chile is uh, characterized, first of all, um, with its diversity. I hope most of you have tried Chilean wine. If not, it's time to do so. Uh, but we have wine, we have fruit, we have seafood, we have food innovation, some, not as much as here, but some. We have meat, uh, we have bee products, organic food, nuts, pisco. Um, our, our food sector represents almost 5% of, of Chile's uh, GDP. We have almost 1,000 products that have been produced and exported from Chile. Uh, we, we serve more uh, than 170 markets, mainly China, Japan, and the US are our main markets. And we have a lot going on in the entrepreneurship area. Um, we had eight 
deals, uh, venture capital deals in 2020, that went up to 28 deals in 2021, from $2 million to uh, 20, uh, $56 million. In so there's a lot happening. And one of the characteristics of our food sector, I'm sorry to, is, um, is that Chile is, uh, let me see if I get it right, is a plant biosecure uh, uh, environment. We have the desert in the north of Chile, the Antarctica in the south, the Andes Mountains in the east, and the Pacific Ocean in the west. So that creates a perfect environment with a diverse uh, geography and, and conditions that make it very attractive to be able to, not only to produce all these diverse products, but also to bring science onto the table. So, um, and beyond all these characteristics, there are three features that characterize the food sector globally and that, that make it uh, globally recognized. The first one is high standards and quality. So if any, if any of you have visited a, a fruit fair, a global flu, fruit fair, it might call your attention that uh, the only stand that doesn't have fruit is a Chilean stand. And that's because no one needs to see or touch Chilean fruit to know it's a, a very high standard. Um, we, we, we serve, as I said, many markets. Markets have each day are more demanding and, and, and uh, demand, uh, demand high standards. So that also takes us to the second point that we, are, we, we have been obliged to uh, be very innovative and to be able to adapt to these high standards. So that also creates a very cool environment to bring science and test all these new technologies we've been talking about. And third, is uh, there's, there has always been a very um, uh, high coordination between the public sector and the private sector in the strategy to be able to promote and develop food. So what are the main opportunities and challenges we have in our food sector in Chile? And I, I, I'll go very fast. These are only three slides. Each slide is half an hour, but no, no. Just, uh, so, um, and, and I wanted to bring these on the table because uh, I'm here also to invite all the scientists present to come closer to Chile uh, and to help us address these challenges and opportunities. So I'm separating these opportunities and challenges in two parts. The first part is the production process. So in the production process, we have uh, resilient farming. Uh, so how do we do it with climate change to be able to address climate change challenges and uh, not only deal with water scarcity, but also how do we deal with all these new pests that are coming uh, with the new climate conditions? And how do we do it to create uh, new varieties in our crops that are able to be more resistant to water scarcity and these new pests? So we've seen several exciting technologies, especially biotech, uh, they can help us deal with this. Then we have upcycling. That is another interesting opportunity. So the food industry, as most industries, uh, generates uh, organic waste. And there's a whole lot of opportunities that can help us bring that organic waste and create more value from that organic waste, uh, integrating with other sectors, and also developing new business models that can help us uh, develop functional food and uh, other exciting solutions. And finally, within the production process, the value chain, we have food, food shelf life we've been talking about. Uh, we need to be each day more efficient in the use of water. And, and of course, we need to give our customers each time more information uh, in real time regarding where this food is coming from. And the second part, the second group is product innovation. So we've, we've spoken about uh, alternative proteins. We have plant-based, uh, based in mushrooms, algae, insects, um, uh, proteins. And we also have cultured meat, or someone called it lab-developed uh, meat, or something like that. Um, these are things that I'm not just mentioning them as rocket science. 
We have projects going on in each one of these areas in Chile nowadays, and we're very excited to bring new technologies and new entrepreneurs to help us address this. And then we have healthy food. How do we do it to uh, go for minimal uh, food processing, uh, clean label, superfoods, nutrition, research and development, etc. And as a final point, we have obviously ongoing challenges, uh, as we also have here in the, in the US and globally. All these challenges require each day more collaboration. They require, require our companies to be more agile, and they also require, as you just mentioned, uh, more agility in the regulatory processes. So how to collaborate with Chile's uh, industry? And uh, just a few words on Sofofa Hub. That is the organization I represent. Sofofa Hub is a spin-off from the main business association, as Ramon said. And uh, we're very close to companies, to corporates. So we work with corporates from different industries, uh, some, of, some of them here present, actually. And, uh, but we also work a lot with the Global Innovation Network. So we had a few conversations with some entrepreneurs from Boston yesterday, and uh, just as we did with some entrepreneurs from Boston, we've also had with entrepreneurs from Israel, from Australia, from Germany, from Czech Republic, etc. because we're really a hub that connects corporate challenges with innovative solutions. So if you want to help us address these challenges and get closer to the Chilean industry, uh, Sofofa Hub, is I'm, I'm your contact. Uh, we're also working closely with local authorities. Um, and we have a special uh, uh, interest in biotech. We have a center of, transla uh, of uh, translational biotechnology that is within Sofofa Hub. Uh, I really believe that biotech is the future. Uh, our industry has been using chemical solutions. Our industries have been using, and different sectors have been using chemical solutions uh, in spaces where biotech can really be a revolution. Uh, this center is funded by the Chilean government, as Ramon mentioned, and uh, we're very excited to support also uh, biotech te uh, biotechnologies that are born in this biotech environment to be able to apply it not only to human health, but also uh, to food and to the agri-industry. So uh, this is where you can learn more about us and uh, please reach out directly. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you so, much. <clears throat> so many great opportunities. So <clears throat> I know we're running against time and I see Fernanda waving at me, but <clears throat> I want to ask one question, you can see I had like 150 prepared, but I want to choose one, which is not, it's not easy, I've been debating the whole time. And I want to frame it this way to keep it a little bit broad. So I think we're all in agreement that we want people to eat better and to eat healthier. If we all had a magic wand, if you had one thing that you would want, we want to work on, whether it's related to what you're doing already or something else, something that you've seen, you think interesting, what would that thing look like? What would that magic wish look like for you to say, like, this? if we are able to solve for this, nail this down, it would have a huge impact on how people eat? And I'll let anybody take the word first, and we can go around. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to start beginning the line. So uh, for me, it would really be having the super early and, and super um, detailed diagnostics to know what's going wrong with our bodies much earlier. Right now we test up here. I want us to be testing here because by the time we get sick, we're already sick, right? And I do think that we would, as I said in one of my talk, I do think we would change the entire global food supply chain if we had better insight much, much earlier on into what was making us sick and, and how we could be better. That's amazing. And only because I work in this space, I want to ask you, where in this gap is the microbiome? If we were to learn more about what's going on in the gut, yeah. how, how close will we get to that vision? It's, so right now, you know, you can do sort of biohacking. You can send your poop in the yep. mail and there they'll tell go. you what's in your gut. You buy them. Um, but there's a, little dis there's a lot of discrepancy in those tests right now. So the science has to advance, you know, the consistency of I send it in through this and that, whatever. And our doctors, if I showed my doctor those results, which I have, she goes, I don't know how to read these. 
So there's a lot we have to do in medical training. There's a lot we have to do in the standards and the care of how those samples get done. They should be done in a lab, maybe at a doctor's office. Right now you can't. So that needs to evolve. But microbiome testing, all the testing, urine analysis, all of it needs to get way more sophisticated. I love it. And again, teaching doctors more about nutrition, I think is huge. I don't know if one of you, we're stealing one of your ideas, but uh, Philippe, do you want to go next? Yes. Uh, I think the goal would be like to be able to uh, indifferentially go to plant-based or animal and, and, and not make a difference. Because again, uh, having the same nutrition benefit from uh, a plant-based uh, food uh, is really good. We know it's much better. There's no cholesterol, nothing. And then ultimately you're doing this not only for you, but for the planet. And that's really the, the case. I don't want anybody to stop eating meat. I'm a eat, uh, meat eater. I love meat. I think it should be not a luxury, but something that you don't have to consume every day uh, too, too many, too much. Uh, we overeat protein, so we have to be mindful about this. And, and just eating plant-based alternative, um, I think it's, it's very important. And we're working towards making it more nutritious, making it good. And we'll be able to actually uh, tinker it to, um, to, um, for everybody, like you know, precision nutrition somehow, uh, depending on, on your needs. So I think there's, there's a good big goal here. I love it. So Flexitarians of the world unite. Yes. yes. Let's, go, let's go out to flexitarians. Yes. They, yeah, for, for me, a large part would be a focus on the supply chain, right? And we have, you know, people hungry, right? In this country, in countries as biodiverse as Chile, in countries like my own, Jordania, th there are people that are hungry, there is food that is being thrown away, and there are farmers that can't sell their food either. Right? And so things are being wasted at the farm gate. Things aren't being wasted necessarily by me and my house or by the Walmart, but it's also at the farm gate when you harvest enough, but then there's nowhere to sell it to. Right? And so can we have that food be more resilient? Can I ship it hotter? Can I ship it farther? Can I enable a new product in a new market so that that new food desert can have you know, sliced whatever else that might be? Right? And so for me, the future of food is health, and health to me is really a more sustainable and a more resilient supply chain. Love it. That's awesome. Alan? Well, since Philippe uh, took my, uh, <laughs> already made my dream come true, uh, uh, I, I think um, I'm really amazed. I, I'm not an expert in food, but I'm really amazed at the opportunities science brings today to be able to uh, address our challenges. Uh, unfortunately, I think we can't go as fast as we want because of regulatory barriers. So if I had a magic wand, uh, I think I'd find a way to bring our authorities together to be able to be more agile and move at the speed we need to be able to apply this wonderful science to the challenges we have today in our, in our different industries and in the world. I love that. We were talking before how much debate is around what is healthy food in, in the U.S. with the FDA. So there's still a lot of room for improvement there and a guidance to the, to the regular population. Guys, this has been amazing. I really appreciate you having here. This has been awesome. A great way to spend our after lunch. So a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roman. And we're taking a selfie with all the panelists, come over here. <laughs> of course, there's of course. traditions here. Oh, we have even the... Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.